All right. Welcome to the DDPS seminar, everyone. Uh, before we introduce our invited speaker, let's go over some usual rules as usual. First, please mute yourself during the talk. If you have immediate questions, you are welcome to unmute and ask. But otherwise, uh, please use the chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in the Q&A session at the end. Second, today's seminar is open to external audience, so no classified discussion is allowed. Finally, the talk will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. Now, let me introduce our speaker. It is an honor to host Peng Chen, who is a, currently a tenure track assistant professor in the School of Computational Science and Engineering at Georgia Tech. Previously, he was a research scientist at the Oden Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences at University of Aust uh, Texas at Austin. Before joining UT Austin, he spent a year as lecturer and postdoc at ETH Zurich in 2014 to 15. He obtained his PhD degree in computational mathematics from EPFL in 2014. His research is driven by challenging problems in scientific and engineering fields that involve data-driven modeling, learning, and optimization of complex systems under uncertainty, and focus on scientific machine learning, uncertainty quantification, Bayesian inference, experimental design, and stochastic optimization. Today, he will talk about derivative informed neural operators. Please enjoy the wonderful talk. Now, without further ado, let me hand it over to Peng by asking a random question. Yeah. So, if you could attend a lecture by any scientist in the past or present, who would he or she be? Wow, that's a uh, very Good question, I would say. Uh, well, there are apparently a lot of uh, scientists that I like uh, to learn from. And uh, uh, one of, uh, you know, the leading scientists that would be uh, uh, Richard Feynman, uh, a physicist. Uh, and I learned a bit more about their, you know, physical background and, uh, you know, the, the sort of like the first principle models that, uh, you know, we're approximating today with the to achieve informed in your operators. Yeah, that would be a, definitely a good choice for, by many others as well. So uh, thank you. So uh, please go ahead um, with your talk. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for uh, your kind invitation and also uh, introduction. So today I'm going to share uh, some of our recent work on, on derivative informed neural operators. It's a class of neural operators uh, that are designed to address essentially optimization problems. Construct, uh, constrained by uh, large scale partial differential equations and also um, with many different applications, as uh, Tony mentioned, in uh, Bayesian inference, optimal experimental design, and uh, stochastic optimizations. So, this is a joint work with Jim Wu Go at Georgia Tech and uh, with Professor Omar Gattas, uh, Jin Tun Luo, Thomas Oliver Raspberry, and uh, Umberto Vela from uh, UT Austin. So, let me start with uh, a few examples. Um, so the first one is uh, uh, the Bayesian inference of, of Antarctica ice sheet flow. So here you can see essentially the in-star uh, satellite observation of the surface ice flow velocity uh, of the Antarctica uh, ice. And uh, over the years, there is accelerated uh, ice sheet flow. And uh, if all the Atlanta uh, ice sheet get melted and, and uh, get into the ocean, and there is a significant uh, sea level rise. So we care about this problem. Um, so, uh, the model itself can be described by, you know, the, the nonlinear viscous incompressible uh, fluid flow, essentially the stocks flow. And the uncertainty of the problem um, depends on, you know, the basal sliding field. Essentially, it's the boundary condition between the boundary, um, uh, sort of like along the boundary uh, of the ice and land. So, we don't really know about the basal sliding field. We want to infer uh, this field from the observation data. And in particular, I want to find the uh, maximum a posterior point of this parameter. And here, uh, there's a, some recent work on you know, finding this map point by solving an optimization problem, essentially a Newton um, best uh, optimization problem. And you can see here, uh, this is essentially the um, map point, maximum a posterior point of the parameter um, at the bottom boundary. Apparently, it is a, a random field. It is a you know, a random variable at each um, point, and it's infinite dimensional. After discretization, it could be very high dimensional. 
And the second example is a, a optimal experimental design for tsunami uh, warning. So here you can see uh, essentially uh, how to deploy a surface buoy and also a tsunami. -ter. So once there is a, a earthquake in the sea flow, um, like the sea flow motion, you can quickly detect the acoustic wave uh, from the tsunami -ter and the surface buoy, and you can pass it down to their tsunami uh, warning centers. And the uncertainty uh, of these problems comes from uh, you know, the slip along the earthquake fault. So essentially, their uh, earthquake fault uh, due to this um, pressure, high pressure, that generated their uh, tsunami. It is uh, uh, depending on space and time. So essentially, uh, space and time dependent stochastic processes. It's also quite high dimensional after discretization. And uh, so the model can be described by, you know, this elastic uh, acoustic gravity wave equations. And also, once there's a tsunami generated, uh, it follows this shallow water equation. Uh, so essentially, a tsunami is propagated to the coastal city, um, where it can model by shallow water equation. And uh, the optimization problem is essentially we want to place the sensors, this is tsunami and the surface buoy, in order to detect their uh, earthquake and also, um, you know, make some uh, tsunami warning uh, forecasting. And uh, so these sensors are actually placed to maximize the information that it can gain from uh, um, the, the sensors. All right, so the third problem is about stochastic optimization uh, with application for direct self-assembly material. It is, uh, for instance, potentially can be applied in semiconductor uh, error. So here, uh, what you can see is uh, the die block polymer. So you have two segments and have a different like a force to attract them to form different patterns. And uh, uh, so these patterns can be formed by placing certain uh, guiding post or certain the so-called guiding post or uh, substrate so that the materials can form into um, the pattern or morphology that you want. So the model itself can be described by either self-consistent field theory or non-local uh, kind of hilly equation that I've been working on. So uh, uh, here's a uh, uh, one type of uh, target morphology, and uh, we can place a certain substrate, for instance, here, can place a substrate, and it will attract the material uh, to form this target morphology, right? And uh, so the optimization problem would be to uh, properly design the substrate, or in another uh, application, the target morphology uh, looks like this one, and then we can uh, place our guided post so essentially, I want to decide their locations of the guidepost such that the equilibrium state uh, is driven as close as possible to the target morphology. But however, the problem is, uh, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in this system too. There is, for instance, random initial phase of the materials and the material properties and also their uh, temperatures of this process. So this uncertainty are also uh, very high dimensional. And uh, for instance, here, at a given optimal design, because of this uncertainty, uh, the equilibrium can converge to, you know, different uh, sort of like a state. Here you have a state that you want that is close to the target morphology, but however, there are some other uh, equilibriums and there are sort of like a defects of the material. You want to minimize this kind of a defects by stochastic optimization problem. So uh, over these three different uh, examples, we can uh, formulate uh, a few um, like abstract problems. The first one is the forward uncertainty propagation. So you have a complex system uh, described by a mathematical model R. You have a state variable U here. And uh, now you have an uncertain parameter represented by Ceta. Ceta, as in all the examples, it could be very high dimensional. And you have a certain probability distribution. And then you can propagate the uncertainty of the parameter through this system to some quantitative interest. For instance, in the tsunami warning system, you can predict their uh, water web height or, you know, the magnitude. And uh, so uh, there's additional uh, variable Z. Z could be their uh, optimization variable, experimental design variable. So second problem is Bayes inference. So given some uh, data, which is typically noisy, the data actually, uh, you know, a collection uh, of uh, some observation of uh, your state variable U here. And uh, you have additive noise uh, epsilon follow certain uh, noise distribution. So uh, the Bayes inference problem is actually to characterize the posterior distribution of the parameter theta, uh, which is uh, you know proportional to the likelihood function times the prior. And uh, given the data, you can effectively reduce uncertainty of this parameter. And this reduced the parameter, reduced uncertainty can also be propagated to their 
uh, quantitative interest. But one of the problem could be like, how do you, um, in the first place, collect the data, right? This is an optimal experimental design problem. So uh, you can see here, we have a uh, information gain, calligraphic U represented by calligraphic U. So we wanna maximize this information from our experiment, from our sensors. And this is Z stands for the experimental design variable. And it's averaged with respect to um, the data, all the data. So essentially, uh, we want to like uh, optimize our sensor locations in order to collect the data to uh, reduce their uncertainty as much as possible. As you can see, after the optimal experimental design, you have a reduced uncertainty for the parameter. And uh, again, you can propagate it to their quantitative interest. At this stage, with a well-calibrated model, you can solve the optimization problem. So you have some quantitative interest. It could be like the control or design objective. And uh, this is still is a random variable. You want to uh, compute some statistical measure or risk measure, and you want to minimize this risk measure. And there is additional, uh, let's say, penalization uh, term or regularization term. And this is Z here stands for uh, optimal control or design variable. All right, so th there are about like uh, there's uh, four different uh, problems we consider. And uh, there are some common challenges for these problems. The first is that uh, the model uh, typically quite complex described by partial differential equations I've been uh, reviewing for these different examples, and they're expensive to solve. And on certain parameters that they're high dimensional, uh, they could have like a very uh, complex distributions as non-Gaussian, uh, multimodal, and locally uh, focused, locally concentrated, for instance. And then uh, um, additionally, the, for the optimization problem, including the experimental variable, the control variable, design variable, those could also be high dimensional and also non-convex. To address this uh, challenge, uh, we exploit the following opportunities. The first is that uh, we can construct a certain surrogate models with the required accuracy, and also those surrogate models can be evaluated very fast. And secondly, so for the high dimensional parameters, and uh, typically the, from the parameter to the solution or to the observables in your inference problem or to the objective in your control problem, those maps are typically intrinsically low dimensional. How to exploit the low dimensionality uh, would be one of the opportunities. And then for the optimization problems, uh, typically for high dimension, for high dimensional optimization problems, we can use a derivative best method or adaptive uh, optimization method. This method are typically uh, dimension independent. All right, so let me, uh, you know, proceed to this forward problem. It's essentially the forward uncertainty propagation. And uh, there are many different kinds of, uh, you know, the uncertainty quantification problem, uh, including the model reduction, the polynomial chaos, and recently the neural operators. So we want to approximate the solution operator essentially from the theta to the solution U or some quantitative interest map. This quantitative interest could be a scalar, a vector, or a function. And uh, we want to approximate it by a neural networks F uh, indexed by the neural network weights parameters W. And there have been uh, several different neural operators developed over the last few years, including their Fourier neural operator, uh, which you know uh, sort of like transform their input by Fourier transformation and uh, build the neural networks in the frequency domain. And also there is a deep uh, O-net deep operator network uh, where the output is represented by a sort of like a linear basis. These bases are constructed by so-called the trunk net trunk neural network, and the parameter are mapped through the branch net. Um, to the coefficient of this linear basis. And then there's a, a sequence of uh, development for reduced basis architectures of the neural operators, including the, the so-called deep learning uh, reduced order models and uh, the PCA net, which, which essentially you apply uh, the principal component analysis for the projection of the input and output map. And also uh, recently developed this derivative informed projected neural network. And also there are a couple of uh, comparison papers on different neural operators, including the following two. Um, one is uh, you know, the comparison for the uh, Fourier neural operator and depot net, and another is a, a comparison of um, including these two different neural operators, and additionally, there is a PCA net and some other uh, reduced basis architectures. So one of the conclusions from these comparisons is uh, you know, for larger scale and high dimensional problems, especially those problems with intrinsic low dimensionality, this PCA net and also this POD depot net. Essentially, you perform some projection of your input output to low dimensions. Those uh, neural operator tends to be uh, performing the best from the perspective of uh, cost and accuracy trade-off. I'm gonna explain a bit more about this point. 
So the first development we had was under this so-called derivative informed projected neural network. So essentially, instead of their uh, PCA uh, net, where you project their input parameter theta into a, a PCA basis or like a Kahuna law of expansion basis, we actually project it down to their active subspace, which is uh, uh, computed by forming this Jacobian of this Q uh, transpose and this multiply this Jacobian take the average with respect to their distribution of parameter theta and then you compute the eigenvalue decomposition. So you take the eigenvectors at the subspace, which is an active subspace for their, you know, the output Q. And you project their parameters into this active subspace. And for the output, it would be their POD subspace. Essentially, uh, you collect uh, snapshots of the output and you perform the POD or SVD on it. And you project their uh, output to this basis. And then uh, after the projection, we have a neural network sort of like living very low dimensions, low dimensional input and low dimensional output. You can construct this neural network uh, with much a smaller number of uh, training data. And uh, this also corresponds to the uh, so-called encoder and decoder, but this encoder and decoder actually constructed more explicitly using the projections. And we have error bound for the input and projection trailing uh, by the trailing eigenvalues. So essentially the projection error uh, where you, from, uh, you have a, you know, the output and the projection from the input and output uh, measured in L2 sense that can be upper bounded by their uh, trailing of the eigenvalues from the input and output. If this eigenvalues decay pretty fast, then this error uh, could be quite small. So here's a, uh, one example on Hamel's equation. So essentially here, uh, we have a parameter theta on the velocity and uh, theta is a, a Gaussian random field. And uh, we have a source term here and we have observations uh, of, uh, um, of this state variable along here, the surface. And uh, uh, so we have uh, the input projection, well, the input uh, parameter dimension is 16,000. And uh, by projection, uh, we can get it down to, let's say the dimension of eight, uh, 16 or 32, depending on the decay of the eigenvalues. And here we have two different uh, neural network. One is our deep net, and also another is without any projection. For this two different neural networks, we have a degree freedom for the neural network as 2000 and also about 3.4 million. So uh, uh, we have two different projections. Uh, as I said, one is uh, you know, the PCA or the KOE, California Law of Expansion basis. So this does not reflect any, their, any of their, you know, their solution behavior. But for the active subspace, you can clearly see some uh, wave patterns, right? And uh, so here's a, uh, the accuracy of a neural, net, neural network approximation with an increasing number of training data. And uh, we have different projections, including active subspace projection, the KROE projection, and also we we'll simply draw some random projection basis. And then we have uh, the full space uh, neural network. So the blue line indicates the accuracy by the active subspace projection. So essentially you can see with a small number of training data, you already arrived at a quite high, high accuracy and it's better than the other two projections and it's better than the full space uh, construction. For the full space, because you have a lot of degree freedom, you need a lot of training data to arrive similar uh, accuracy. Okay, so here's a sort of like a scalability test uh, because we have uh, the projection to the same dimensions. It is uh, uh, independent of their input dimension. I said from the parameters theta, we have either 4,000 or 16,000. And uh, but for the deep net, by projecting to the same dimensions, we have the same dimensions for their uh, neural network, but the full space would have a different degrees of freedom. And we have a similar um, um, behavior for, for the different projection neural networks. Okay, so the second problem is about Bayesian inference. Um, so here's uh, uh, the abstract formulation of the Bayesian inference. Y, again, is our data observation data, living in dimension S, S could also be quite high. And theta is our um, uncertain parameter. We have the from parameter to observable map f. f is the observation of your state variable, right? So essentially, uh, this f depends on your state variables. And we have additive noise, uh, which is a Gaussian distributed with a covariance gamma noise. And the BS rule states that the posterior distribution of this theta, given your data y, is actually uh, given by the likelihood times the prior. The likelihood is a you know, the, the data are conditioned on the theta. And then uh, this is uh, normalized by this so-called model evidence or normalization constant. 
and is actually the integral of the likelihood function with respect to the prior distribution. But since the parameter theta could be very high dimensional, uh, this model evidence term is typically intractable for computation. And uh, there have been other, uh, many different kinds of methods developed for solving Bayes inference problem, including the Laplace approximation, which is essentially you build their uh, Gaussian approximation of a posterior at the map point. And uh, uh, there is a MCMC uh, sampling techniques and also many of the variants, including um, using, you know, their uh, derivative information using dimension reduction. And there is a sparse quadrature. So to compute this high dimensional integral or some other high dimensional integral with respect to the posterior, you can apply the quadrature or sp um, based on sparse grid. And uh, we will have some uh, recent work on that uh, using Haitian um, best sort of like uh, rescaling of uh, the, the dimensions and uh, sparse quadrature. And then there is a, a whole class of different variational inference using different transport maps, including polynomials, uh, radio basis functions, and neural networks. So um, here uh, we focus on um, just to find the maximum a posterior point, uh, which is used in the Laplace approximation. So assume we have a, a Gaussian prior, uh, where we have the mean theta zero, and also the covariance gamma prior. And uh, so the map point is actually given by the solution of the optimization problem, where the first term is a data misfit. It's a misfit between the data and also your from parameter to observable map weighted by the uh, noise covariance. So see here, this is uh, the data Y. Uh, this is essentially the satellite observation of the uh, flow velocity. Uh, and uh, so the second term is a, uh, you know, sort of like a regularization term or your prior knowledge. This is the difference between the theta and your mean weighted by the prior covariance. And by solving this uh, optimization problem, you get a map point, maximum a posterior point. So here you can see, uh, this is a map point tended from this optimization problem. And then at this map point, you can evaluate uh, your forward map from the theta to F and evaluated the map point. And this is actually, uh, this is an evaluation, which is quite close to the data. Um, but to solve this optimization problem, you need to either use the gradient-based or Newton-based methods where, you know, this Jacobian of uh, the forward map uh, is involved or the Hessian is involved if you use a Newton-based method. And, uh, well, in order to uh, construct a surrogate for this from parameter to observable map, uh, our neural operator or neural networks it should be accurate not only for the map from the theta to f, but also uh, reliable for the Jacobian from theta to the Jacobian of f. So uh, here is our derivative informed neural operator. We have the same um, projected neural network. I will have input projection to the theta r as a projection of uh, our theta by this input projection basis of psi. And uh, our neural network is evaluated by you know, this uh, neural network map in the between, and also it times this basis uh, of the output basis. So now uh, to train this neural network, we actually include another term, which is the Jacobian, because we want an accurate Jacobian uh, in the approximation. So the loss function essentially includes these two terms. One is the, the small neural network for the uh, low dimensional input and output here, and also the, you know, the projected output. And then the second term is the Jacobian. It's the Jacobian of the neural network with respect to the input, which is uh, the low dimensional input, right? And uh, so you can compute the Jacobian and then also project it from the left and right to the low dimensions. Now, instead of uh, like a million by million dimensions, you have a, let's say 10 by 10 dimensions, depending on your uh, number of projection bases. So how does it perform? Let's see uh, for a particular inverse problem with the Darcy flow, which is quite simple. We have observation points here, and this is our true state variable. It follows an elliptic problem, which is a log normal diffusion problem with uh, where the theta is Gaussian distributed with covariance given as a, uh, this elliptic uh, uh, operator, the fractional elliptic operator, which is corresponding to the Martin uh, covariance, where we have a delta and a gamma, those are positive uh, parameters that can control the correlation and also variance of their uh, random field, and also we have a Laplacian term. So um, now to compute the map point, uh, we can replace our forward map, uh, the F, by our neural network approximation, right? This is our 
uh, approximation of uh, the dyno. And uh, so uh, we can actually solve the optimization problem in low dimensions in their input projected coefficient dimension, uh, coefficient space, for instance, here, instead of uh, the original high dimensions, it is uh, simply in the theta r, which is a projected dimension. Let's say instead of a millions, it is a 10. And you can solve this uh, optimization problem in much a low dimensional um, space. And uh, you can replace the original forward map by the neural operator. So here are the results. Uh, let's look at the right first. So we have uh, the three different uh, quantities that we approximated, including their forward map to solve. And on the right is a without the Jacobian training. It's simply like a just a training for the effort to solve without the Jacobian. And you can see there is a decay of the error with increasing number of uh, uh, training samples. This is a relative error. And also you can observe the same for the reduced Jacobian. So here you can see uh, we have the reduced Jacobian. We want to approximate this reduced Jacobian. And this is the decay of the reduced Jacobian in red. And then in a green, there is a, the map point um, so this is a map that we approximated by solving the optimization problem using the dyno, uh, using their uh, neural network without their uh, Jacobian training. But on the left, uh, we actually included the Jacobian training. We can observe not only the map itself, F here, and also the reduced Jacobian, they're more accurate than if you do not include the Jacobian information. But more importantly, for the map point, it is much more accurate than this map point, uh, about one order of magnitude improvement so uh uh yeah this is a you know using their dyno to find the map point and by the optimization and here so we have a mesh size of 64 by 64 and also tested for 128 by 128 you can observe a similar behavior and uh, the neural network size is the same because the projection dimension is the same again and uh all right so now let me come to the uh, third um, example, which is an optimal experimental design problem. Uh, so here is for, in particular for the optimal sensor placement, uh, for instance, here for the placement of the sonometer uh, strategically. And uh, the problem can be formulated as uh, to place a certain number of sensors out of uh, a D candidate sensor locations. You could have uh, like a really large number of uh, uh, candidate sensor locations and you want to select only a small number, R number out of it. So the observable uh, map F is given by the so-called design matrix times uh, the observation at all the candidate sensor locations. So the design matrix itself is a, a matrix of R by D. And as you can see here, we have nine candidate sensor locations. If we select the first sensor at the third place, where we have the first row at the third, uh, third column is one. And uh, you know if the second one second sensor is picked at the fifth point, but then the second row has a fifth column one, or the other is a zero. So essentially this design matrix is a binary. It's uh, uh, in fact a Boolean, and is text value of a zero and a one. The sum of all the rows uh, is, is one, and the sum of all the columns, uh, sorry, the sum of all the columns is one, the sum of all the rows is a number between zero and one. In fact, it's either zero or one. So you need to solve our optimization problem with respect to this design matrix. And here's a, a one particular formulation, which is based on the variance. So the variance based optimal experimental design, where we have the optimality from the you know, statistical community, the A optimality or D optimality. The opt A optimality is defined as a, the trace of the posterior covariance. And suppose you have a Laplace approximation, which is a, you know the posterior covariance evaluated at the map point and you take the trace of it. The trace essentially measures um, how uncertain it is, right? how much uncertainty you have. You want to reduce this uncertainty by design this W. So essentially, uh, you want to minimize respect to this W. But this trace actually depends on um, you know, the realization of your data Y and also your design and W. So essentially, both the map point and also the covariance will depend on this Y and W. So you take the take the average with respect to this uh, y and this is theta. And the d-optimality is uh, the determinant of this covariance instead of the trace. Now, the posterior covariance um, under the Gaussian assumption, it is given by this term. So you have the Hessian of the misfit term, and you have uh, you know, the Hessian of the uh, prior uh, regularization term, which is uh, simply the covariance of the prior inverse. And this will be the Hessian term. 
So the Hessian term uh, involves the second order derivative. You can actually approximate it by the Gauss Newton Hessian. Uh, here, you only care about the first order sensitivity information. You have the Jacobian value added the map point. And here is the Jacobian transpose, this is the Jacobian and the, the uh, noise covariance. So essentially, you need to compute uh, this map point and also this Jacobian repeatedly again and again for a uh, given data y and also the design w. Apparently, this is a, a quite a challenging for large scale uh, PD constrained optimal experimental design problem. And uh, so here, uh, more recently, we developed this new, the so-called derivative informed Jacobian neural operator. What well, the reason is because our uh, dyno is derivative informed neural operator um, can compute the map point pretty well, as we showed before. But however, for the full Jacobian, uh, the approximation error is actually quite large. Our reduced Jacobian that we uh, measured is relatively small, but for the computation of the full Jacobian, which is needed here, uh, the approximation is actually quite bad. So we developed this Jacobian neural operator where we perform a Jacobian projection. First of all, a project a Jacobian projection um, onto the subspace formed by the active subspace. And then we have a reduced Jacobian. We vectorize it again uh, for many different snapshots at different locations. And uh, we perform another SVD on it. Uh, so essentially another uh, projection and we can get a relatively small uh, dimensional uh, quantity. Now we can build a neural network to approximate the Jacobian, and then we can reconstruct this Jacobian. And uh, for this one, we call this Jacobian uh, neural operator. And uh, in fact, uh, you would wonder, uh, you know, here you have a, a parameter that can project into different subspace, right? Either PCA subspace and also active subspace. And in fact, for the uh, computation of the map point and also the, you know, the Jacobian, the, the trace and determinant, we need to use a different projection basis for the input. And here's evidence. So on the left, uh, we can observe, you know, this is a, the reconstruction of the map point. You compute the map point and you project the, this map point into different bases, either active subspace or the uh, PCA subspace. As you can observe here, if you project it down to the PCA subspace with increasing number of bases, you get a smaller and smaller error. But if you project down to the active subspace, uh, the error still remains quite large. And uh, while well, the reason is because the map point is actually uh, is found not only with respect to the data, but also there is a regular regularization term. This PCA basis are actually the eigenbasis of the prior covariance. And for the Jacobian itself, you need to project it down to the active subspace in order to get a small uh, approximation error of the Jacobian or reconstruction error for the Jacobian. And because this Jacobian uh, depends sensitively on the first order information. Right? Okay, so we applied this um, Jacobian neural operator uh, for the evaluation of the trace and also determinant. On the left, it is a trace. You have the final element to trace estimation. Essentially, we don't use a surrogate here. We take it as a truth. And we have a neural network trace estimation. And I can see it is a very highly correlated. And uh, we have error. Uh, the mean of the error is about uh, less than 1%. Standard deviation is 1.2%. And for the approximation of the determinant, it's about a 2.3%. Uh, also with a standard deviation, 2.55%. Essentially, they're very uh, highly correlated. So you can trust your neural operator to select your sensors. Okay, now let me come to the last one of a stochastic optimization problem. And uh, so, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, this stochastic optimization problem can be formulated as a, you want to minimize a certain control or design uh, Z in a certain admissible set. And uh, you have a sort of like a risk measure or statistical measure of your objective function Q. And then you have a certain penalization term. Uh, here we consider a special um, risk measure, which is a so-called conditional value at risk. So let me give you an example here. Here's the density of uh, your Q, right? It's a one dimensional Q. And uh, uh, so here's a value at risk for a given um, parameter beta. The beta is sort of, sort of like the, the you know, beta quantile. Here is, is the probability. Um, this area is the probability. And uh, this one is uh, the quantile, which we call this value at risk. The conditional value at risk is essentially um, the average or the uh, integral of uh, this quantity of interest. Uh, for the quantity of interest larger than this uh, quantile. 
So essentially, you take the average uh, of uh, uh, this Q with respect to the probability and density here. So uh, the conditional value at risk provide a, a more conservative uh, a risk measure. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, it is often used in you know, the um, financial engineering risk management is also called the expected shortfall, the, the loss. It varies between four different beta. If a beta equals to zero, and then essentially uh, you, you can uh, you know, use the risk neutral uh, approximation, risk neutral uh, minimization. And if a better equals to one, essentially care about their uh, extreme case, which is a worst case scenario optimization. And uh, this is CVAR uh, can be reformulated as a, uh, you know, the minimization problem, I respect a certain real number T. And then you have a here as Q minus T, you take the positive part stretch holded uh, for the positive part. And since this is a stretch holding is non-continuous, it's non-differentiable. Uh, uh, so, uh, Oh, sorry, so it's not it's not smooth. If you want to apply any, uh, let's say, gradient or uh, Hessian best optimization method, um, you want to do some smooth approximation as exploited in this recent paper. Okay, so uh, for this uh, OUU problem, I call it like optimization under uncertainty OUU problem, uh, we develop this so called multi input reduced basis uh, derivative informed neural operator. So the reduce, reduce basis is quite clear. We use the reduce basis for input output projection. The body input is essentially, you know, we have a, the input of the parameter theta, and we do the projection of the parameter into low dimensions. We also have an optimization variable. So we have multi input, right? So typically uh, here, we can consider either high dimensional uh, optimization variable or low dimensions. And in particular for this work, we consider parametric uh, optimization variables instead of function valued um, optimization variables. So it becomes a relatively uh, moderated dimensions. And uh, so now we use the same POD projection for the output. We build a neural network in between. And then uh, we also train our neural network by including the Jacobian with respect to the optimization variable instead of with respect to the parameter now. So because we need to solve the optimization uh, with respect to the optimization uh, variable and the all right, so now uh, our data generation and training are both scalable in the sense uh, in our loss function, as I briefly mentioned before, we project everything down into the low dimensional subspace, including their uh, function itself and also the Jacobian. And uh, so now uh, the quantity here in the loss function is actually quite small dimensional. But one particular point is that, uh, you know, you have to compute this Jacobian, right? The Jacobian of u with respect to z. You have to generate the data. You would wonder, uh, could it be quite expensive? And, but in fact, it is not. Uh, we can solve it very efficiently by exploring the joint best method. So essentially here, the Jacobian data generation uh, attacks only this number of additional linearized PDE solve. And uh, this number, you know, the projected dimension for the output and also the dimension for z. And uh, so this Jacobian projected into the uh, output dimension is given by this one by chain row. If you take the Jacobian, and uh, you would have a, uh, you know, this um, Jacobian of the operator PD operator with respect to the state variable, and this is a Jacobian with respect to z. So for this problem, uh, essentially have to solve because this is this becomes a linearized PD operator at a given u, uh, even if it is uh, the PD uh, itself, it is nonlinear. So you can solve this. Um, sort of like linearize the PD operator, um, depending on their uh, size of RU and the DZ, you can solve either uh, here as a sort of like a linearized forward problem or linearized uh, adjoining problem. And then again, so you have to solve it for, you know, um, perhaps like a 10 or 100 times, depending on this dimension, right? But in fact, here, this is the same uh, linearized operator. You can just factorize it once and reuse it as a direct solver or preconditioner. So here are the uh, two examples. Let me uh, let me focus on the 2D Navier-Stokes equation. To solve the state PDE, you have about 13 seconds. Um, but for one LU factorization, it's only three seconds. And after you factorize it, a subsequent LU solve for this Jacobian generation takes a, a, a small fraction uh, of the time. So here's a cost accuracy comparison for the OUU problem. And uh, on the left, uh, we counted their uh, computational cost in terms of uh, how many PDE solves we need. 
So uh, we have either the neural operator as a surrogate, or we can solve the PDE directly, right, as a reference. So in the offline, uh, we can generate the data, the solution, the Jacobian for the neural operator by solving a certain number of PDEs. And uh, in the offline, we don't have to solve any PDE if we use a PDE-based OUU uh, method. And in the online, we don't have to solve any PDE for the neural operator-based surrogate. And but for the uh, PD best the case, we need to use some sample average approximation to compute their risk measure or the C bar, for instance. And then we need to solve a lot of uh, PDEs, each of the optimization step. And for the uh, accuracy, so essentially for the approximation of the C bar, there is a, a apparently bias from this surrogate, right? But the variance can be very small because you can afford to use a lot of samples to evaluate this C bar. But for the PD case, there is no bias but there is a sampling error. You can only afford to um, solve so many PDEs to evaluate the C bar. So there is a sort of like a, this bias and the variance trade-off. So here uh, for solving this OUU problem, uh, we can use either you know, the surrogate, the neural operator or the PDE, and uh, we can measure the total cost by the number of uh, state PDE solves. And uh, the state PDE solves are used for you know, the training data generation for the neural operator and also uh, you have to solve it uh, if you use a PD based uh, optimization. And then we can solve the problem. Uh, we can compute some reference uh, solution or reference choose a solution, which is to solve all the PD based uh, optimization uh, problem with a, a sample size in the sample average approximation pretty high, 4,000. And then now we can uh, compare uh, the C bar essentially at optimal controls and we can measure the relative error uh, against the reference. This is uh, what we're going to do. Uh, to measure uh, the cost and accuracy uh, trade-off. So here's an example, which is a flow control ar around a bluff body. We have an uncertain input uh, velocity field. It is a, a Gaussian random field. Uh, we assume that is a, uh, only in one direction, in the uh, x direction, and as a Gaussian random field is a Martin covariance. And uh, we have a control variable along these two body, which are parametrized by B splines. This uh, phi of a z is a control variable, uh, and this z is a parametric control variable. Now I have a two different objective function. One is a viscous dissipation objective function, which is a, uh, you know, it takes the uh, sort of like a, a symmetric version. This is a, the tensor product. It takes the integral of it. And uh, another is a tracking type objective function. You want to minimize the difference between your u velocity and also target velocity. We have a penalization on the velocity, on the control velocity here, with a penalization parameter alpha. So here's our discretization. We use a non-uniform mesh, uh, and uh, we use Taylor Hood uh, find the element. Uh, we use a Galerkin least square stabilization uh, for to stabilize the problem, and it was weakly imposed boundary condition for the Dirichlet boundary condition. And also we use a viscosity continuation to solve the problem. So here is a full dimension of the state variable is 42,000, and the reduced dimension is about 200. And the parameter along the boundary is quite small, it's about 101, and uh, we still do the you know, projection to this 100. And the control is uh, 18 dimensional, it's parametric. So now uh, the full neural network architecture is actually quite small. The combined input is 118 dimension. The output is 200 dimension. We use hidden layer, uh, the dimension is 400, two hidden layers. And here is the result. We have a minimized viscous anticipation without a control here. And you can see their viscous dissipation is effectively minimized by solving this problem. Uh, well, uh, let's take a look at their, you know, uh, the cost accuracy comparison or trade-off. So here we present uh, three different uh, solvers. One is uh, the PD solver in black. We don't use any uh, surrogate, but we use like a certain number of uh, sample average approximation samples in order to compute their C bar. And uh, this is an increasing number of uh, samples to compute the C bar. And uh, this is a total number of uh, PD solves along all their uh, optimization steps. And uh, this is a relative optimal cost error. We can see uh, with increasing number of uh, sample average approximation samples, uh, you can uh, have a smaller uh, error, right? an error for their optimal cost. And then here we have another two uh, different surrogate. One is uh, without the Jacobian training, and one is uh, with the Jacobian training. So here, these numbers indicate their number of training samples. For instance, here we use 256 training samples, 
we can uh, achieve about this um, error that is uh, comparable to uh, here uh, the PDE uh, solve using this number of uh, PDE solves. So essentially, there is about one order of magnitude reduction of total number of PDE solves, including other offline data generation uh, for the surrogate models. And apparently, this Jacobian training, this dyno, is much better than their uh, neural operator without Jacobian. Um, and uh, here is a viscous dissipation, and here is a tracking type. For the tracking type, is uh, even more evident. Is essentially with about 256 training samples, it achieved the error uh, that cannot be achieved by the um, PD solve even up to uh, this number of uh, total PD solve about two orders magnitude more PD solves. You can you still cannot achieve the same accuracy. So essentially. Uh, our Mr. Dino achieves about like uh, about 100 or one and two, uh, a 10 to a 100 more sample efficiency compared to if you just solve the PDs. All right, so here is an interesting comparison. Um, so here on the left, we just compare the accuracy for the solution in L2 error, right? So with the uh, with the Jacobian training, uh, about 256 samples, we about we arrived about 200 uh, two percent of error which is larger than if you do not use Jacobian training. And, uh, um, but however, for the OUU problem, if you measure the optimal cost, and it's actually smaller than uh, if you do not use Jacobian training. So essentially, this Jacobian training uh, does not only help to improve the accuracy for the solution, but more importantly, it, it increase their accuracy for the OUU solution. All right, so here's a, a few other uh, computational cost. Uh, so for the 2D Navier Stokes equation, after you constructed one evaluation, it takes about this second, and you can actually evaluate it batch wise as we did. Uh, so about 2000 samples, uh, you can evaluate them together. It only takes about 0 0.3 second. And uh, uh, so essentially there is a, a acceleration about uh, 100,000 uh, uh, times compared to the PD solve. Um, and, uh, so here is a total cost, a breakdown of the total cost. Let's look again for the Navy stocks. If you just generate the data of the solution without Jacobian, this is uh, the time, about 13,000 seconds to generate the data. If you include the Jacobian data generation, it's only an um, incremental cost. It's about a 25% more cost, 16,000. So essentially, all the costs are actually spent on the data generation. The pre-processing for you know the projection and also the neural network training actually uh, are very uh, cheap because we do everything in the reduced space. All right, so here's a, a test case for 3D Navier Stokes flow control problem. Uh, again, we have uh, this is similar setup, but it's in 3D now. The stated dimension is one million. The reduced dimension was still use two hundred, and the parameter along the boundary now is two D case is four thousand and the reduced dimension is 100 again. The control and dimension is about 50. So each of the forward solve for this nonlinear 3D navier stokes equation, uh, it takes about 30 minutes using 48 CPU cores. And uh, we generate about 448 samples for the training. And after the training, we can achieve about 1.5% of uh, uh, the error for the approximation of the solution. And then each of the neural network evaluation uh, is about like uh, 10 million times faster than the PDE solve. And more importantly, we can uh, solve the OUU problem, uh, optimum control problem, subject to this uncertainty very efficiently. And here we have an uncontrolled case for the viscous dissipation. And here after their optimization, you have a reduced viscous dissipation. And we solve um, this problem after the construction of a neural operator. Uh, we solve this whole problem uh, under one minute. And if you think about the one PD solve already tech uh, 30 second, uh, 30 minutes, and this is a uh, 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 very efficient. Okay, let me uh, come to my conclusion. Uh, so we developed this derivative informed neural operators and all uh, and several of its different uh, variants, and has a sort of like the merit of uh, the accurate approximation for their input to output map, right? The map of a uh, so solution solve the map of a. Uh, there uh, from the parameter, uh, the observation uh, uh, optimization variable to their um, objective function to the observables. So uh, by using the dyno, uh, this approximation becomes more accurate compared to without using 
the Jacobin training. And more importantly, uh, for the Jacobin itself, it becomes very useful in the optimization problem and becomes more accurate. And we use the reduced basis architectures, and then uh, we make the training in the reduced space. So uh, this training becomes scalable. It's independent of the nominal dimension of the input and output space. And only, um, and also we showed that uh, for this dyno, it only requires a, a small number of training data for our test cases uh, compared to without using the Jacobin. And, uh, and also it is very powerful for all these different optimization uh, problems, including the, you know, finding the map point in the inference, uh, optimal experimental design, and optimum control problems on uncertainty. Um, so this work is uh, sponsored by uh, NSF, DOE, and DOD. Uh, you can find um, you know, pretty much the results in these uh, slides and these four different papers. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for the wonderful talk, Peng. Um, yeah, I find it very interesting. I think um, our audience do as well. So let's go to the Q and A section. Um, yeah, now right now we have we don't have any questions yet. Uh, if the audience have a question, please like use the raised hand or um, feel free to unmute yourself. But maybe I can kick off with a question. So I I myself find the derivative training very, I mean, crucial and important question to think about in practical applications using all these nonlinear structures. And I'm curious about the details um, of the Jacobian compression using the basis that you show very at, in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So in my experience, these derivatives um, can be much harder to compress than the state variables. So does it yeah. happen to your problems? Uh, yeah, this is actually a, a quite a good point because typically uh, for the compression of uh, you know this F, this uh, map itself, uh, it is a uh, uh, much more, let's say, like a, a, it's, it's much easier than the compression of the Jacobian. And uh, in our test case, uh, this Jacobian is also is quite hard to compress. That's why we applied this two layer sort of like a, a compression. First, we apply this uh, input um, projection using this active subspace evidenced by here. And uh, active subspace is actually quite crucial. If not, and then you see this reconstruction error is actually quite big if you just use a PCA. And the second, we do another layer of a compression uh, by vectorizing the Jacobian matrix as a vector, and uh, we perform another SVD on it. So this is a, a compression, uh, so sort of like a two layer compression from very high dimensions as a matrix to a, a small dimensional uh, coefficient vector. I see. Yeah, that sounds a very smart idea to like circumvent those issues. Maybe I can take advantage of your smart idea next time when I um, have to like do some compression to the derivatives. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Talk more about it. Yeah, sure. Uh, so John has a question. So um, he asked, when constructing a surrogate, do you always sample the observation points uniformly? Uh, yeah, that's another a very good question. So. Um... In our projection uh, construction, we actually we sampled uh, pretty much all uniformly. We we draw the samples from let's say uh, here uh, here for the construction here. We draw the samples according to their distribution. Let's say for the parameter theta is a uh, Gaussian distributed, we draw samples from the Gaussian distribution. But this is a uh, um, not necessarily the most efficient sampling. For instance, uh, in our last case of a uh, stochastic optimization. Uh, and uh, if we want to sample more meaningful or helpful samples uh, for the C bar, right? We would draw samples from here instead of uh, a lot of samples here. And, uh, but we haven't uh, explored this idea yet. Okay, so uh, thanks for the answer. So I, I don't see another question. So maybe I can ask one more uh, about the, uh, the la very last application that you talk about the yeah. The oh, you like yeah the optimization and mm -hmm. the uncertainty. I see, like yeah, this is a fantastic example. I like uh, I learn a lot. But so the model problem here is still like um, like a static. Um, I mean time independent case. So do you see like this? Um, I mean this approach can be extended to like time dependent problems. And what will be the difficulties there? 
Yeah, this is an excellent question. Uh, in fact, uh, for these different cases that I showed, uh, they're all uh, steady state. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on their you know, neural operator approximation from their input function to output function. We're currently working on uh, time dependent problems. Um, of course, there is a, uh, first of all, uh, our framework depends on the you know, reduced basis architecture. In time dependent problems, especially for like, uh, for instance, wave propagation, this is not necessarily you know, low dimensional. Uh, we can perform perhaps some other like uh, encoder decoder with nonlinear dimension reduction. And secondly, we need to adjust our neural operator uh, to also take into account the, the time uh, input. For instance, there are a few different uh, approaches uh, using like either a depot net uh, where you have the time in the trunk net mm -hmm. or you have a, like the neural PD or neural OD type of uh, approach. And uh, there are also some other uh, different approaches that we've been exploring. I see. Yeah. F thanks for the answer. Like, yeah, I, I find all the applications very interesting. And yeah, I, I, I think many uh, audience in the lab will be interested in like knowing more about your work. So thanks for giving us the talk.